Hello, and welcome back to the Dialectcon podcast, where we critically engage in philosophy and correlate philosophy research to contemporary issues at an easy to understand and digestible level. My name is Sara Shavasava, and I'm your host. This week, we're joined by Professor Sam Reese Dennis, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rice University and affiliated with Rice's Medical Humanities Program. Hi, Professor Reese Dennis. How are you today? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. Of course, and thank you for your time and for being here today. Uh, before we begin our discussion, I want to ask you, how did you get into philosophy and, and what stood out to you? Well, um, my parents are historians, and I thought that I wanted to be a historian, too. Um, when I got to college, I took some history classes and I wanted to do this big project with a professor who ended up going on sabbatical, I guess. And so I started to question whether that was what I really wanted to do still. And I really liked philosophy. I, I, I had taken a couple of philosophy classes and I really liked them. And I'm kind of a slow reader, actually. And I was, I, I liked how the courses really encouraged you to read a shorter piece very carefully, which is sort of my natural style. And so I thought that it was fun and I was good at it. And I changed my major and they assigned me to an advisor who really encouraged me and was very nice and supportive and just kind of went from there. So when you were like interested in philosophy, was that like the history of philosophy? Like, were you like trying to study the history of philosophy, like ancient Greek and all of that? Or was it like just traditional things or like <laughs> ethics? I, uh, yeah, well, I actually, um, I took this course. It led me into this graduate seminar where we read some new work in ethics and this was around i guess 2008 or 9 and one of the major books that had just come out was this book called moral dimensions by tm scanlon who is a famous philosopher at harvard and he had this part of the book about blame and i you know read it and thought oh this is all wrong look at all these examples that he analyzes wrongly and i've come to think that it's a very good book um, but it was exciting to me to feel as though I could take, you know, stories or insights or what I thought were insights from my own life and from interpersonal interactions with my family and friends and sort of use those to not only criticize his view, but to try to build, build up my own view. And that was really fun for me. <laughs> and I continued to, to work on that book and on that topic and kind of all of the moral emotions or especially some of the negative ones, blame, shame, guilt are, are some of my favorites. Um, those have continued to interest me actually, even since I was an undergrad. So that I, that's what I've always really been interested in. Okay, awesome. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, actually, um, especially when, you know, you're in a position where you're able to like refute a lot of people. I mean, that seems very intriguing. Um, a lot of kids like debate and, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a debater. So like, I like refuting things um, yeah. in good yeah. faith, in good faith. Um, well, I'll just say, I also did a, did a bit of high school debate and I was solid, um, not spectacular, but I was pretty good. But I thought it kind of brought out some of the worst elements of my personality sometimes, just like wanting to crush and dominate other people in arguments. Yeah. Um, whereas, and I think there was probably a little bit of that driving my initial interest in philosophy. But one of the great lessons that my advisor as an undergraduate and actually my advisors in graduate school taught me over the years um, was that really philosophy works best when you take a more collaborative attitude and kind of acknowledge how hard it is to have genuine insights about humanity in our lives. And I think um, it's sort of been really good for me in some of the ways that debate was bad for me, if, while using those kind of same intellectual muscles. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, debate is like a great way to get into it, but there's like a lot of other external factors, like, for example, doing well gets you really competitive and like those things kind of shape the way in which you learn. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think debate's a great way to get into it. Um, but for our specific podcast topic today, we're talking about bioethics, which I guess takes a little bit of a turn from these emotions and stuff like that. But before we get into kind of more of your research on bioethics, I wanted to ask like and clarify what is bioethics? What does that term kind of 
revolve around and what questions do bioethicists explore? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess to give kind of a short answer, um, I'm sure as all of your listeners can imagine, or uh, I mean, I'll just say there are many hard questions that arise in the context of science and medicine. So questions about the limits or ideals of clinical research, the ideals of the doctor-patient relationship. There are just really hard questions that arise in hospitals, for example, about end-of-life care, about treatment of patients who are incapacitated. And I mean, there's just so many fascinating ethical questions that arise in those contexts. And so bioethics is sort of a, a subspecialty of ethics that um, you know aims to make some progress on those questions. So I guess, uh, given its nature um, of like targeting these questions, right? Is there any like external value to exploring these questions? Like, for example, you mentioned um, like end of end of life care for for a patient. Do bioethicists make make the guides that doctors study and and use in these scenarios, or um, do they help in like policy decisions, et cetera? Um, well, the, the short answer is yes, they do. I mean, it, it kind of depends on what kind of bioethicist one is. So just to give your listeners a little bit of background, um, you know, I mentioned that I was interested in blame since I was an undergraduate. As a graduate student, when I was at UNC Chapel Hill, I wrote a dissertation that had a lot to say about blame. And I argued for the value of a certain kind of angry blame, even. <laughs> So an attitude that many people feel uncomfortable about, let's say. I found that that was especially the case in the context of medicine. So um, I, I started getting interested in the question of how should doctors and hospitals and patients and their family members react when the doctor has made a medical error. Uh, and as it turns out, many of the people writing in the bioethics literature, in fact, just about everyone says the last thing you should do is blame. Because if you start blaming people, everyone gets angry at each other, it gets out of control, people are scared to come forward and admit it when they've made a mistake. And I didn't really see it that way, especially thinking of it from the perspective of a family member or the patient himself. Um, I think that there's value in expressing your emotions in hopefully a productive way, standing up for yourself. Anyway, so that's like a whole substantive point. Um, but just to get back to what I was saying, I ended up writing something up about this, getting a fellowship at Johns Hopkins and their bioethics institute, and then getting a tenure track job at a medical school, Albany Medical College, where I had been until just a couple months ago. And when I was there in the ethics department of this medical school, it really put a lot of pressure on to make some pretty big decisions, or at least to help make some pretty big decisions. And so there are a couple contexts in which I got to do that. One was as a clinical ethics consultant, where it's a big regional uh, hospital. And if a doctor or a nurse or a social worker, or even a patient or one of their family members had an ethical question about the course of a patient's care, they could call us and our faculty would take turns being on call and try to help them work through it in a way that is well-reasoned and consistent with prior decisions and hospital policy and all this. So that is one way that it, very practical, you know, you're helping people to make sometimes life and death choices. So very, very serious and kind of easy to see how your ethical reasoning could, could make a real difference. When the pandemic hit, then I started to pivot more into helping to make hospital policy. So one immediate fear was that the hospital would start to run out of different things, actually. So ventilators, blood products, vaccine doses. Um, I, along with some of my colleagues in, in the ethics department there, got to really drive some of that hospital policy that ended up setting uh, rules for who should get what, um, who should be prioritized and so on. So those are just a couple examples of things that I've done that have 
made a direct difference. But of course, you know, there are other things as well. I mean, there are national councils of bioethics that help to, you know, set U.S. policy too. I mean, really, it's kind of, um, you know, one thing I really like about bioethics and I like about teaching bioethics is that, you know, someone's going to make the decision about what happens next. Like you have a person who's in the hospital and something's going to happen with their medical care. And you can either make that decision based on what's financially best for the hospital, what, what the doctor feels like doing. I mean, there are a million ways you, you, you could go. And bioethics is just about figuring out what the best way to go is or what is right. And people do that all the time, even if they don't have the official bioethicist title or something. You mentioned this kind of right now, but like, and, and you talked about it earlier as well, but there's this thing called like about perspective, right? Different decisions or different guidelines based on different perspectives might seem fundamentally wrong, might also seem fundamentally right. So how does a bioethicist kind of take those two points and try to find like the middle line? Um, or I guess, I mean, not really, I guess there, you could also just take the hard right or hard left route, but like, what is the best way to kind of like merge those two and kind of find like a, a thread in which both parties are almost like satisfied um, and it doesn't seem to be like too wrong of a, of a guideline. Cause again, like it, some of these decisions can be like literally life or death. Right. So yeah. how, how does like one do that? That's a great question. I think, I mean, this really, this could be a really long answer. I'll, I'll try to keep it fairly brief. So the, the hope first of all, is that there are at least some fundamental principles or values that we could basically agree on. And my own feeling about this is that, you know, bioethics as an academic field was really born, at least in the, in the form we, we, we see it now in the wake of the second world war, Nuremberg, um, there followed by, you know, various really grievous abuses of uh, patient rights. And sort of in the wake of all of that, I think there was a need in, in the biomedical world for an assertion of some clear ethical principles. So whereas maybe before you had some idea, some ideal of the doctor as this, you know, man with a calling who has a duty to care. Now you really had kind of a reorientation toward basic human dignity, basic human rights, the autonomy of the patient or the research subject, where maybe even in like the, the 1950s and 60s in the US, you would have doctors, you know, performing medical treatments on patients and not even telling them what they were doing. Like now that would be not quite unthinkable, but there's a broad consensus that that would be wrong and even against the law. So things have really shifted. I And Obviously, the shift toward those values, you know, it's not like you can't question those fundamental values of patient autonomy, dignity, respect, but I think that they really do give a sense of meaning and purpose to people who work in science, people who, who work in medicine. And so those are kind of the, the core values that I try to stick to. And I find that both doctors and patients tend to agree on those. So with that in mind, when I had the chance to set hospital policy and rules, I always tried to make sure that the rules were, that, that I was making the rules or advocating for rules with those basic values at the forefront of my mind. So I wanted to ask myself, okay, what kind of rules should I make based on like the deep conviction that every patient is an individual who deserves to be treated with a certain kind of respect and dignity? Like those are some abstract values, but you can kind of try to fill them in a little bit. And then when you have those rules and policies in place, then I, I think when you start to make the individual choices, you have to stick to those rules. Like, so if you have a set of justified rules, it's good to stick to them so that it's consistent, it's fair. You can explain why you made the decision you made. And obviously that's that's glossing over a lot of a lot of complexity and the kind of difficulty of um, certain specific cases, but that's the general framework that I like to follow. That makes sense. And I guess like 
about these case by case scenarios, do do your like guidelines expand as cases arise or like are there like moments where you're like, oh, this isn't something that's specifically mentioned or that we specifically examined while creating these guidelines, but we have to go by the rules or is it like, you know, you know what I'm talking about where like there's like yeah. these exceptions. So how do you guys handle that? Yeah, that's a good question. So again, you always kind of want to refer back to the core values. So I'll just tell you what I did. So I think, first of all, if you ask this question to 100 clinical ethicists, you'd probably get 100 different answers. But I'll just tell you what I did. Um, When a case would come up about the course of a patient's care, first thing I would ask is, does the patient have capacity to make the decision for herself? And what that means is basically, does this patient understand the risks and the benefits of the treatment? And if the answer to that is yes, and the doctor has explained the risks and the benefits and the patient understands it, they can kind of repeat it back and then then they can make their own decision. If they lack capacity, if for some reason they really can't understand what the doctor's telling them, then I ask, okay, do they have a surrogate decision maker? Do they have a friend or a family member who can speak for them and kind of try to reconstruct what the patient would say if she could make the decision right now for herself. So based on that patient's values, what what do they think the patient would say? And that already can get you pretty far. And I think, you know, again, it's consistent with this basic value of patient autonomy, the patient's dignity, not being forced to do something that totally goes against their values and so on. And so that's kind of one, one part of the answer. And then sometimes you get a really, really hard case where it's really complicated and none of your rules really speak to it. And then in that case, I found that the best thing to do is just to get everybody in a room, all the stakeholders, and just see if you can come to some kind of agreement that people find at least acceptable. Um, And then once you come to that, maybe when the next one arises, you can kind of refer back to that and say, all right, here's how we did it in, in, in this other case. So you have kind of a body of precedence that you can appeal to, to sort of help you if things get hard, but there's really no way of, I mean, sometimes the hard cases are, are just hard and there's a limit to what you can really say. You just have to make a decision and, you know, know that you did your best. Okay. So like in those, in those decisions, like, let's say there's like a, a very like an emergency case, um, mm-hmm. those split second decisions that like doctors will make about treatment, et cetera. Um, obviously those are based in some sort of prior ethics, but like, does ethics here like take a precedence over action or is it always like an action takes precedence over ethics? Un- like if it's a new case or something like that, cause like, I'm, I can imagine that like that job of like planning for every single case is quite literally impossible. Like there's so many nuances, but like, I would still imagine that, uh, hospitals must have some guideline about, you know, action first, then the ethics, cause it'd still be like an ethical decision to save a life. Yep. Right. So like what, what, what happens there? Um, and is that differ in, in hospitals? Um, I, I, I mean, I would say it, it's always governed by ethical rules and values. So they, we, we had very explicit hospital policy that we got to help write that was informed by New York state law, actually, that governed, you know, when you could treat a patient and when you couldn't. So if it was an emergency, so, I mean, let's say you have a patient who comes into the emergency room and they're non-responsive. So they, so you can't get their consent. And if you don't treat them right away, they're going to die or be seriously injured. In our hospital, we had a rule that said you could do that. And in fact, you should do that. But what if you had a case where the patient comes in and says, I don't want to be treated and then loses consciousness? You know, that's a really hard case. And that's the kind of case that we might get called on. <laughs> In general, doctors tend, I I, I think very reasonably, to err on the side of saving the life. But again, you can kind of reconstruct why that might be the case based on on the principles that I've been talking about too. You know, 
it would make a big difference if what the patient said seemed to be a response to a true understanding of all the options and their consequences. It would be quite different if the patient came in and was really, really drunk or had been drugged and was saying, you shouldn't treat me. You know, then you would justifiably think this person doesn't really understand the consequences and therefore it wouldn't really be promoting his ability to autonomously or rationally self-govern if, if we didn't treat him. So then, I mean, it's very complicated. There, there are a whole range of cases, but I think you can get the idea from those two. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think like this, this could probably go on forever because there's like an infinite amount of cases here. Um, yeah. But I guess like I have two real quick questions on kind of bioethics, like their training. Um, so yeah. like, how is one trained to be in bioethicist? Like, do you have to take medical training? Like, I know you're, you worked at like a medical college, right? Or medical school. So like, mm -hmm. obviously there's like a hospital and there's, I'm assuming like doctors, hopefully, <laughs> but like, um, like at other places, like, do you have to necessarily know the medical stuff or do doctors explain that to the ethicists or, or like guide everyone through it? And like, it's like a group meeting or something like that. And then you're kind of going through things. Um, how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it really varies from place to place. In general, it really helps a lot to know something about medicine, which was an obstacle for me because I didn't know anything about medicine. So when I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins, I got to shadow a doctor who was a pediatric hematologist and oncologist and was also the chair of an ethics committee at a hospital in Baltimore. And I would just follow him in his inpatient clinic and his outpatient clinic. I would go to the ethics committee meetings with him and kind of see what he did, how, how he handled the cases. And when I got to Albany Medical College, I, I kind of did the same thing with other more senior ethics consultants. But in terms of knowing the medical stuff, that just takes time. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of jargon, um, a lot of, you know, just it's a it's just a whole different field of study that I obviously don't really know. And even now, you know, my knowledge is minuscule, but it's it's a lot greater than than it used to be. Um, so really the key is, as you said, to get the doctor to explain it to you really well. And you can't be afraid to say, I don't understand what that means. You know, and doctors, I think, get that. I mean, it's one of the skills of being a doctor to, to really be able to explain complex medical information to non-experts. You know, that's one of the main skills that doctors ought to have. And you just can't make the ultimate ethics recommendation until you have all the facts. So I always had to remind myself, you know, not to be embarrassed or ashamed if I didn't know something because it's just too important. You can't just go into the decision with incomplete information. So it's not like a job requirement per se, but like it would be really helpful to have that medical information or knowledge, right? Yeah, it's not a job requirement, I wouldn't say. Um, but yeah, it is helpful and certainly the the disposition to just ask until you get it or have a good enough understanding of it is really, really important. I am. I think that could also be really intimidating too, but um, I, I guess I have a question about like how you focus on like what you want to explore in bioethics. Cause like there, again, we've talked about this, but like there's so many different areas to explore so many different cases to explore, but how do you come up with your research? Does it just like something that you see or find interesting? And then you just, kind of get in the rabbit hole and then like write about it or like read about it and learn about it? What, what exactly is it? It's, it's basically what you said. It's, you know, I already mentioned how I kind of got my start, which was looking into what various people in the bioethics literature had said about medical error and how we ought to respond to it. And so I'm interested in the moral emotions generally. And so that's kind of a natural bridge to being interested in the moral emotions in the context of the doctor patient relationship, which is one of my interests. But as I also mentioned, you know, working in the hospital during a pandemic, so many issues were just coming up and I was having to help make these choices along with, with my colleagues. And I found that after I kind of dug in and did the research and talked to people, I had things to say. And so I ended up kind of 
working on those topics and then also doing a little bit of writing on kind of what you asked at the beginning, like what, what I think bioethics is, can be, should be, what the fundamental principles and values are, which are philosophical questions um, that I, I felt like I was in a position to answer, at least partially. I mean, I think that makes sense. It's also like so cool about philosophy, how you can like explore literally anything that just comes up. And like, it's really rewards like those rabbit holes. Cause like, I know personally I've had so many times that I've just like went into something super deep and like you get engrossed into it. So like, it'd be really nice to like have a product out of that too, rather than just general understanding. Um, but I guess I want to shift the discussion a little bit to what you were talking about earlier about like these fundamental values that kind of everyone knows and respects in the field. Um, and, you know, you've written this paper called Understanding Autonomy and Urgent in Intervention. What's your essential premise here about autonomy? Um, and I guess I want to ask as well if, if most people in the field agree about that fundamental definition of autonomy, because seeing how autonomy can be very, very important when it comes to these decisions um, it would be, you know, kind of difficult to see, or it would be like really weird to see a lot of debate on this topic. Cause that could really inform like guidelines and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, okay. So the, this paper is a paper that I wrote in the context of the pandemic when people were thinking about the need for certain limits on personal conduct, certain restrictions. So restrictions of freedom of movement, let's say, if you had been quarantined or put in isolation. And then later, the same thing kind of came up with vaccination, although those questions are slightly different. But um, that kind of debate is often framed as, okay, it's personal autonomy, me getting to kind of do what I want and go where I want, um, you know, versus overall welfare or like the common good or something. And I do not think that that is the right way to frame it. So that's the urgent intervention, which is, you know, I, I don't know, I kind of regret the subtitle, but you know, whatever. I was very motivated at the time to get this paper out there because to me, it, this isn't something that I like made up, but it, in the philosophical world, people study autonomy and think about it in a little bit different way than what you kind of hear in mainstream media and even in the world of bioethics, where um, to respect a person's autonomy is not just to let them do whatever they want to do. So no one would say, oh, you know, you have to give me your wallet because you have to respect my autonomy and I want it. Or like, I get to beat you up because it's just my autonomy. So like no one says that. So there's a more nuanced understanding of what respecting a person's autonomy really involves, what a reasonable right of autonomy would be that I think doesn't really require you to say that a person's autonomy has to be constrained by other principles. And by other principles, I mean like overall welfare or concern for the common good or something like that. I think you can generate all those restrictions from the principle of autonomy itself. And what I mean by that, I, this sounds very complicated, but what I mean by that is just something very simple, which is kind of what I said earlier. Like you just start thinking, okay, what rules would I make if I had in mind the equal autonomy and dignity of all? So why can't you just take someone's wallet? It's not because it's bad for overall welfare. Like maybe it would be good for overall welfare. You know, maybe they didn't really want the money anyway and you really needed it. I mean, you can make up whatever story you want. The reason you can't do it is because it would not be consistent with a rule that would that um, was informed by an appreciation of the equal value of everyone, the idea that everyone's perspective carries the same weight, at least in principle, this idea of kind of the, the autonomy and the dignity of all. So you just don't allow people to do things that would put innocent people in harm's way just so they can get what they want because that would not be a way of respecting the autonomy of those other people. So that's just a very basic point where you don't have to go and say, well, in these public health crises, it's all about overall welfare, but in these other cases, it's all about autonomy. Like that's a kind of a very confusing view. It's like, you know, says who, 
How do you know, like why all of a sudden is the main principle different just because we're talking about more people being involved? Like to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's also really not the explanation that we want. We want an explanation that makes appeal to this idea that we're all moral equals. We all have autonomy. We all have dignity. You don't just get to hoard the scarce resources for yourself because you feel like it or put other people in danger because you feel like it. It's, it's just interesting that like when you were describing that, I'm, I immediately thought of like the categorical imperative from Kant about yeah. how like, you know, you'd only do what you would have everyone else do um, as a general, I guess, rule of thumb for why you wouldn't steal a wallet. Because if you stole a wallet, then everyone would steal a, steal a wallet, which isn't probably good. Um, so like, it's interesting, like that kind of relationship between like, I guess, Kantianism and, and also like medical ethics here, I guess, or like describing what understanding of autonomy um, I guess like a quick follow-up question uh, on like this autonomy debate here um, is what happens and you know you mentioned that you should kind of treat everyone as like equal um, but you know in a capitalistic society what happens when you know there's other external forces that come into play in terms of and I guess like we can think about this through like COVID and like ventilator support uh, like let's say there's someone who's struggling with COVID and needs a ventilator support, but another person who's richer has more access to money and resources also requires a ventilator. In those type of situations, um, is there some guideline like, or is there like agreed upon guideline for what should happen? Um, I know practically speaking, I probably know what would happen, but like in terms of like ethical guidelines, like how is that debate here in terms of like external forces? And it just doesn't have to be like money. Let's say it's also like maybe like friendship with a doctor or like I mean, like a million of other other like values and sort of like external like things. How does that kind of come into play here? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Let me back up for a second and say something about Kant because you, you know, kind of brought it up. Um, so just just to be clear, the reason it's not OK to take someone's wallet just because you feel like it is not because if everyone started stealing people's wallets, the consequences would be really bad. It's because stealing someone's wallet is not consistent with a conception of other people as having equal value. That there's a certain kind of Kantian deliberative perspective you can take up where you're keeping in mind that other people's perspectives and other people's projects have the same basic value as yours and you don't just get to disrespect them because you feel like it. And that is a very deep and very appealing value, I think. And that's a really good way to think about these public health problems without having to say, well, you know, in these contexts, we have to maximize welfare and in these contexts, we don't. Okay, so that's one thing. In terms of allocating ventilators, you definitely don't wanna do it by who gives the hospital the most money, <laughs> as you noted. Um, I, didn't, I haven't heard of any hospitals that actually use such a policy, although, of course, as you know, when you're in the healthcare system, it never hurts to have more money than other people, uh, sadly. In my experience, the one of the, I mean, this is such a complicated question, and I thought about this a lot, So, but, I'll, you know, again, I'll try to keep it pretty brief. One medical value and a value of triage um, in you know, the emergency room, for example, is to treat people based on their need and to not think about who they are, how much money they have, what kind of connections they have. If you have a scarce resource, I think, and I think this opinion is shared by many medical practitioners too, it's really important not to be wasteful in, in your use of it. And so in our ventilator allocation policy, we really wanted to avoid allocating scarce resources to people who would die even if they got the scarce resources. And to instead try to give the scarce resources to people who would live if and only if they got them. Now, even that, which seems, that seems like a very intuitive idea to me and I think to many others, but even that is not a perfect system, actually, because what it means in practice is that people who are sort of doing better at their baseline end up getting more of the scarce resources. So if I would live, if I got the scarce resource or would be a little more likely to live, then I would get a little bump in the line 
But as it turns out, those people who are doing better and are therefore more likely to live if and only if they got the scarce resource tend to be, as you said, richer, um, even whiter actually too. Um, and there is a lot of really interesting empirical work that was being done um, to kind of show that that was the case during, during the pandemic. And so that's something that we really struggled with where you want to not just funnel the resources to the richest people in the community, but you also don't wanna give scarce resources to someone who is gonna die anyway at the expense of someone who, who could live. And so that was one of the main struggles in our ventilator allocation policy. And I'm, you know, ultimately our hospital didn't run out of ventilators. So we never actually had to put this into practice, um, but it was just, you know, it's a, it's a really hard and interesting kind of philosophical and also practical uh, problem. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And I guess like, you know, there's a lot of these cases that did happen at a lot of hospitals across the globe, actually, not just the United States. Um, but, you know, kind of like going back a little bit to what we previously talked about, like aut aut autonomy, I had a quick follow up question um, on the basis of like disagreement. So let's say like there is a guideline in place um, and, you know, like there's an another person who disagrees with this um, yeah. and specifically like the the origins of like why I'm thinking about this is like with abortions um, for some background information. So for like abortions, um, I'll, you know, like the states have rules for like what they like, what you can and cannot do uh, as a doctor now. Um, and so like if the doctor has a personal ethic that misaligns with the state rules or guidelines, um, what happens in like kind of those scenarios? Uh, because like, the doctor is bounded by, I guess, like personal ethics, but also required and mandated by the state. And so like, I wonder if there's any research in kind of like those nuanced cases where there's like a, a fine gray line between what is, what, what is requ like required um, or like what is necessitated by like law and what is desired by patient and doctor. Um, and those intricacies. I don't know if there's like any research there or not, but like what happens in, in, in moments of disagreement? Um, and if you yeah. don't know an answer to this, you can kind of like talk about general disagreement uh, okay. anywhere, but like, yeah. Well, first of all, sorry that my yard guys are out here making a bunch of noise. I hope people can still hear me. Um, so am I right that the kind of case you have in mind is a case where the law tells you to do one thing, but you don't think that the law is morally justifiable. Yeah. And like, what, what should you do? Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a really hard personal question. Obviously the law can be morally wrong. I mean, you don't have to look that hard even to find examples of laws that we see as morally wrong that used to exist that we now have come to see as being morally wrong. Um, and so I, I think it's always open to a person to, you know, violate the law, um, in accordance with her own values. So loud, <laughs> um, you know, and whether or not you should actually do that is just a hard question. You know, if you would lose your job and put your whole family, it's, uh, you know, put your, put your livelihood on the line, you know, that's, that's really, that's just a really challenging kind of question that everyone has to answer for themselves, I guess. I mean, obviously, in some really extreme cases, if the law is, you know, demanding that you hurt an innocent person, for example, like, I think most of us would say you ought not to do that. Um, in other cases, you might think that what the law demands is wrong, but maybe not so wrong that it's worth sacrificing everything for. Um, but I think to really make a lot of progress on questions like those, we would need like a more concrete example. Okay, so like in, in terms of like the domain of that question, would that still be a bioethical question? Yeah. Uh, or like, is that like still like a, is that like more personal at that point? Oh, that's, I think it's, a, I think, well, it's definitely, a, an ethical question. I mean, the thing is, personal questions can be ethical questions too. Like you might think that like the, the first question of ethics is, you know, how should I live? 
And the kind of classic moral question is, what should I do? And where, but the ethical question is sort of, you know, it's not exhausted by what should I do morally speaking? There, there, there may be cases where your moral duty is just not as important as some of your other values and projects. That's, I guess, kind of controversial, but I think many people would intuitively agree that there are limits to the grip that a moral system can have on our lives. And I think those are the kinds of questions that people have to answer for themselves when they're faced with a choice like that. So definitely an ethical question, you know, not one that I really, that I really have a systematic answer to, um, but certainly a very good question. <laughs> All right. Um, so that makes makes sense. And also, I just wanted to let you know that we can't hear the, those yard people, so you're totally fine. Um, but um, on like the questions of like this medical ethics stuff, I kind of want to move on from that and like shift to more of like questions now re revolving around students and like kind of education of ethics. Um, so specifically, maybe in bioethics, I'm not exactly sure if you've taught bioethics, but you mentioned in the beginning that you enjoy it. So like, I guess, how exactly do you teach bioethics, given that, you know, different people will have different values and course sets of values. So how as a professor, are you supposed to kind of appeal to those or like also introduce new viewpoints uh, to students and kind of like adjust to, I guess, your class or whatever? Yeah, well, in this way, bioethics isn't that different from other ethics classes where everybody brings their own values to the table. And this is actually the case, not even in a class too. This is just how you have a conversation about ethics with anyone. You, you listen to each other and you maintain a respectful and open-minded attitude. And you try to come to at least some basic principles that you can make some progress reasoning from. And if you find that someone's basic principles and basic values are so different from yours, that you really can't even talk to each other, then maybe you won't make quite as much progress. But I found that really that doesn't tend to be the case. That even though there's a lot of cultural variation among students, people do tend to agree on some basic principles, or at least they can see where other people are coming from. And so I do use a lot of cases when I teach. I give a lot of examples and ask people, you know, what they think the doctor should do or what they would want to happen if they were in the scenario. And I think that can be helpful to get people motivated. And then, you know, but when you, when you really dig into it, to me, the most fun part is to try to get people to explain why they've made the judgments they've made about the cases by kind of uncovering and then appealing to some deeper values. And often when they get to those deeper values, those values tend to be shared. And people just have sort of different ways of applying them, different ways of thinking about them. Um, but you, I found that you can actually make some progress, at least in a lot of cases. I mean, that sounds like really fun, kind of like synthesizing basically what you've learned in ethics into like case studies and then sharing that case study with like other or like your re reasons for decision with other people, um, which I guess now kind of makes sense as to why collaboration is like almost like really really critical maybe in, in in kind of ethics because like your personal ethics might not be another person's and kind of just like learning from other people is really really beneficial and i guess like for students who are tuning into this podcast right now with like an interest in medicine how can bioethics like help them or how or just some reasons to explore bioethics or even ethics as a whole um and like does it like help contribute to more research um like i guess like Maybe an example would be, uh, you know, I, know, I remember like there was the, the genetically engin engineered um, like um, eggs, I guess, like like human eggs uh, from like China. And there was like a whole ethical trial. I think that person's in jail now, but like there's a lot of different things around like ethics in like the medical field. So what are some reasons to kind of explore ethics and how can it help us as, as students? You're talking about ethics in general or bioethics specifically? I guess a combination of, of both really, maybe. Okay, well, so ethics in general, I think is just really deep questions that are worth asking for anyone. Where, you know, only, only you are gonna live your life and you might wonder what kind of life is best or how ought I to live? You know, 
what should I do when these tough questions come up? You know, those are ethical questions that I think are just worth exploring to kind of deepen your life. Um, or at least, you, you know, your own thinking about your life. In bioethics, you know, I think I, I have a lot of students who are training to become doctors. So obviously when I taught in the medical school, that was all of my students, or at least most of them. And now here at Rice, I have a lot of undergraduates who are on kind of that pre-med track. And I think it's, you know, wanting to be a doctor is a noble and good ambition. And there's so, there's a lot of science you have to know. There's a lot of facts. There's a lot of memorizing. There's a lot of understanding different systems. Um, but when you actually get in the clinic and you have a real patient sitting there and they're real family members, um, you know, the question of how to behave, how to interact with them and what to do when these hard choices come up is not something that can be answered by your science textbook. And it's a, such a huge part of being a doctor. In fact, it's probably most of it, you know, the way you actually interact with other people, like that's what you do all day. And the question of how to do that and what are, you know, what are the ideals of, of the doctor patient relationship or just what makes for a good doctor? That's an ethical question. And I think that's a question that all doctors think about and ought to think about. And the same could be said of science. Um, you know, if you're thinking about like medical research, you know, questions about if I'm doing research on human subjects, you know, what does it mean to get their consent? Like, why is it important to get their consent? You know, what does informed consent really involve? You know, what kinds of study designs are better and worse from an ethical perspective? You know, those are, those are good questions that, you know, again, I think all researchers have to confront whether they do it in this systematic way or not. Um, so I, I think, those questions are always there and they're really interesting and they matter. You know, I, I gave some examples earlier where the answers to these ethical questions really matter. You know, I, I said we didn't end up having to allocate ventilators. We did have to allocate the vaccine doses. And, you know, we had far fewer doses than eligible recipients. And we had to make a system for, you know, figuring out who would get the doses first. And that, really matters. And it's important to have something kind of systematic behind that, that you can justify to everyone and explain. Um, anyway, so those are really interesting questions for people who are interested in science and medicine to take on. Of course. And, and I think like just in general, like ethics as a whole is also really, really valuable to explore, um, especially for like high school students, because we don't get the opportunity to do that a lot. Um, but I wanted to ask you and kind of like wrap things up with what are you doing now? Uh, what is your research focused on now for, for people who might be watching and are interested in that? Um, well, I have a couple projects going right now. One is about, well, so I have one that's sort of just a more general philosophical project about blame and shame and guilt. That is kind of an ongoing that I've, I've published a couple papers about it and I'm working on a few more, but I, I don't need to get into that too, too deeply here, but for people who are interested, you know, feel free to check it out. In bioethics, I'm right now working on a paper that I'm actually co-authoring with a medical student whom I supervised at Albany Medical College about whether or not death row inmates ought to be able to elect to donate their organs after they're executed. And we argue that they ought to be able to do that, but there are various concerns, some of which your listeners can probably anticipate. So people worry that they might be um, compelled to do it. That's a concern. Um, but people also worry that it might afford them a kind of redemption that would be antithetical to some of the goals of punishment. And so this is sort of an area where I have a lot to say because I'm interested in blame and punishment and guilt. And so I, I have something to say about what the goals of punishment are and ought to be, and then something to say about the rights of prisoners too. So anyway, that's, that's the paper that I, I will be working on tomorrow when I go to my office. 
Awesome. I mean, I'll leave a link to your website in the description below so people can check that out. Um, and with that being said, that kind of like wraps up our discussion today. Uh, thanks so much for, you know, your time and kind of discussing everything. I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did as well. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. It was nice to meet you.